Courageous Conversations was launched in 2020 in the midst of the racial reckoning following the death of George Floyd, Regis Korpinski Parkett. In order to have conversations around difficult and contentious issues that were happening and around which we needed to increase knowledge and awareness. So for example, around systemic racism, around racial profiling, um, and around efforts to come to terms with what is to be done. We found two people who inspired these kinds of conversations historically and today, one of whom is Violet King, a Calgarian, who became the first black woman lawyer, and the other was Maya Angelou, the African-American author and poet who said that courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you cannot do anything else consistently. What inspires me is having the conversations with these leading thinkers from across campus, the country and around the world, who have been thinking deeply about these issues, who have been engaged with uh, social justice movements, with university communities, with other intellectuals and activists, with an aim not just for understanding, but also for thinking about how the understanding can be mobilized in order to affect sustainable change. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dr. Melinda Smith and I am the vice I'm the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Research for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in, at the University of Calgary and the host of Courageous Conversation. It is my honor to welcome you to Courageous Conversation event on inclusive and diverse leadership in the post-secondary sector. This follows our previous section on a, a session on EDI trends. Courageous Conversations, as you now know, um, it's a series <clears throat> designed to spark honest and challenging dialogue we need to embrace if we as a society, as you know, universities who are committed to an equitable, diverse, inclusive, and accessible campus, and who are committed to anti-racism, to ameliorating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, to advancing human rights in plural societies, we need courageous conversations to help us with this work and to combat injustice and to build equitable pathways and a future in which everyone can thrive. Before we begin our conversation today, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge traditional territories on which University of Calgary is located which is the territories <clears throat> uh, in the heart of Southern Alberta, which are both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sisica, the Pikunai, and the Kanai First Nations, the Sutsina First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki Bez Paw and Good Stony's First Nation. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. I also need to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Ottawa at the moment, where I'm attending Shirk Council. And so I want to pay tribute to the people, um, the Algonquin people, who are the traditional guardians of this land, and to acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. I want to pay respect to all the indigenous peoples in this region, from all the nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leadership, past, present, and future. Today, I am joined by three esteemed colleagues from uh, uh, the post-secondary sector, but also from not the nonprofit sector, Dr. Candice, Candice Burnett Debaji, who is an assistant professor and teaching fellow Indigenous at Western University, 
Dr. Annette Henry, Professor of Department of Language and Literacy Education at the University of British Columbia, and Dr. Julie Kathley, the Executive Director of Catalyst. Before I introduce um, our four speakers, I go into introducing our four speakers and turn the floor over, the virtual floor over to them. I want to offer a few remarks. I want to offer a few remarks about uh, this issue, uh, the issues around inclusive, diverse leadership. If we say that diversity matters, and we do in the post-secondary sector and in the broader society, we say diversity is the strength, this Canada's global advantage. We also know of the research which highlights that diversity matters for critical thinking, for better decision-making, it, it actually fuels ingenuity, creativity, productivity, and product profitability in the private sector. We say all of these things about diversity and how and why it matters. I don't think we say it enough. That this is so, because one of the, so let, let me say a little bit more about this research. So we know from scholars like uh, Scott Page, for example, that diversity, Scott Page and Lu Hong uh, argue that not only is diversity talent, which sounds paradoxical, Scott says, it is a mathematical and empirical fact. It's, it's, it's important for uh, complex systems to fuel and spark innovation, which raises question about the counter side the implications of the lack of diversity or not fueling and fostering and nurturing diversity. But what I like about Page's work and including the difference model thinker and, and other kinds of work research is how he highlights that a, a, a group of diverse, with diverse perspectives can outperform a group of smart people. So you can have a lot of smart people around the room, around the table, but if they all have the same perspective, if they all reinforce each other's, can finish each other's sentences, that is not going to spark courageous conversations. It's not going to spark creativity and innovation. So we don't want cookie cutter people around the same table, reinforcing affinity bias, reinforcing confirmation bias. We want diverse people, we want cognitive diversity and diverse people in perspectives and ways of going around the, uh, the table. Next slide, please. This leads me then to the work around the diversity dividend, including people like Momani and Sterk, who argue that Canada's diversity and global connection is a, a significant global advantage for us. But we haven't fully realized it. And I would say this is actually true for a number of kinds of reasons. We haven't unlocked talent. We don't necessarily recruit and retain diverse talent, despite all of our conversations about diversity. So we need to advance and embed our commitment to equitable and inclusive hiring, which also means mitigating biases, but also dealing with those difficult conversations, including discrimination, and including, uh, uh, um, including uh, uh, biases, um, including um, self-cloning uh, and cultural cloning, or what David Theo Goldberg <clears throat> uh, uh, refers to as the social injustice of seeing, and Philomena Essett referred to as the social injustice of sameness. So we need to tap the un underemployed talent, including those around uh, foreign credentials. We don't need Canada to be the place where we have engineers and doctors driving taxi cabs only. They should be fulfilling our oh, lawyers, as we have at University of Calgary, we have a foreign lawyers um, a program to for foreign lawyers to, to become uh, a Canadian practicing lawyers. This is what we need to tap talent. We need to invest in language, including multilingualism. We need to change culture, EDI, EDI and, and advance EDI and leadership competency, incorporate inclusivity into our decision-making and core processes. We, universities are remarkable for talking about inclusivities. And yet our everyday practices sometimes are very exclusionary very, very uh, interested in reinforcing the social injustice of sameness, of affinity bias, speaking only to people like ourselves because it's comfortable. 
So this conversation is about becoming more comfortable with discomfort and what it means then not to be included, not to include people who are like ourselves because they don't think the same as we do, or they don't sound the same as we do, or they don't look the same as we do. So we need also to connect the local and the global to think about what this game, what Canada, what, that the migration and immigration and diversity is a brain drain for Canada that also fuels our productivity, our creativity, and, and, and drives our ingenuity, <clears throat> innovation and ingenuity. Next slide, please. You know, at other universities, this is not new. There's a question, the diversity dividend, does a more diverse, inclusive, uh, does diversity enhance our research community? Well, at University of Calgary, we think so with our EDI plan for research and teaching and innovation. But there's also growing evidence, mounds of superb research that highlight how diversity in all its senses, cognitive diversity, uh, diversity of people, ideas, perspectives, ways of knowing, knowledges, a key to good science, key to good scholarship. Nonetheless, affinity bias probably means we still have a lot of work to do because inclusivity is not to get the default. Not yet, that we have to make inclusivity not the exception, but actually the default. And that means we have a lot to work, intentional work to do proactive work to do to be inclusive, because it's actually, to repeat, not the default. Exclusivity is the default. Exclusivity is the default. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so you would say, if diversity means all these good things, why is there this diversity gap? Again, research and research after research shows that, that despite all of our talks, 30 years plus of just talking about equity, diversity, inclusion in Canada, we continue to find the underrepresentation of equity deserving groups. Some people think we're doing too much. The data does not show that. We see that for in leadership in particular, that we have this is the focus of this conversation, that there's been some improvements around gender, there's gender parity, that around lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. What persists is the underrepresentation of racialized people. And I mean Black, so Asian, East Asian, Arab. Japanese, Korean, West Asian, Filipino, underrepresented, even absent, fully absent, or there's the one and only. And the University of Canada recent study just highlights that persons with disabilities and racialized people are underrepresented and they should be a priority for hiring. Next slide, please. But it's not just University of Canada research, research by Wendy Kukier and colleagues at the Diversity Institute at, at, at at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, also highlight the profound underrepresentation of uh, members of equity deserving group, including indigenous, uh, including uh, racialized uh, minorities, uh, and but among racialized minorities in particular, black scholars, black administrators continue to be underrepresented. And what they highlight is that they they call the pyramid of exclusion, where the representation of racialized people decreases as they move up the ladder. Next slide, please. Again, Fuji Johnson and and House uh, House Am also point this out with the diversity gap study, where they said said that racialized men and women hit a ceiling at the level of the associate professor associate dean, and that underrepresentation is significant at the level of dean and higher. And that again, that this needs to be a priority because they highlight the, 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 what they call whiteness, power, and the politics of demographics in the governance of Canadian universities. Next slide, please. So we not only deal with the numbers, we need to deal with, with, with biases, structures, and cultures. Cultures that impede inclusion, cultures that lead to people who are different being expelled, pushed out, marginalized. Many are in medical leave, many leave um, burnt out. What is it about, do we prepare ourselves and institutions to be inclusive? To, we say we welcome people into the campus, but what do we do to welcome people? What do we do to 
and to mentor or sponsor or enable success for people who are different from the majority to thrive. And so there's discussions about barriers, glass ceilings, bamboo ceilings for East Asian, and concrete ceilings for Black folks. There's discussion about biases. What are we doing to deficit thinking, racial profiling, unconscious emotion? Um, and I could talk about the experience at convocation uh, only a week ago, um, where I was went on to, to be roving, and someone said to me, oh, do you have a master's? But that's not the first time that's happened to me. So we have to deal with these kinds of unconscious biases and to think about how disproportionate constraints on people who are different, insufficient support, the devaluation, hostility or chilly climate, and the, which lead to acquiescence and conformity, how they all diminish diversity and leadership. Next slide, please. So we need courageous and inclusive leadership. That means speaking truth to power, even when it's uncomfortable. But it's not easy speaking truth to power because it could also mean you being expelled or marginalized. So there, so there's harm in this. We must be attentive to when we do this and, and to with whom. We need equity, treating people who are different from us equitably as if they belong. We need integrity and moral action. We need social awareness and we need to be open to different worldviews and different ways of knowing. One of the things that's most remarkable is we talk about our commitment to diversity. That means people are different. That means people way of speaking are different, people ways of being are different, people ways of engaging are different. So what is the obligation and responsibility of the majority to understand these differences and to accommodate and learn to live with them? It means being vulnerable, understanding that, you know, we have to be, that vulnerability is important to building trust and belonging, and we need to engage our discomfort. Next slide, please. So now with that introduction, I want to turn the floor over to our three uh, guest speakers, Dr. Candace Burnett uh, Debaji, who is a uh, uh, Muskiko Cree uh, of the Pedabak First Nations, She's an assistant professor of education and teaching fellow at Indigenous Western. Uh, she has held numerous roles, uh, leadership roles at Western and also with the student services. And what I'd be really interested in hearing her speak about today is her book, her forthcoming book in January called Tricky Grounds, where she just she talks, um, engages with over a dozen Indigenous leaders across uh, uh, um, various roles about their experiences not just the numbers, but the experiences uh, in advancing reconciliation and indigenization work in, in Canadian universities. Our second speaker will be Dr. Annette Henry, who is a professor in language and literacy education at UBC. She's also affiliated with their race uh, um, and, and, and gender uh, uh, and intersectionality work at, at, UB, at UBC. She has held a research chairs and she has a numerous uh, short grants working on these kinds of issues. Um, but her research and publication in particular focuses on equity, language, gender, and culture and teaching and learning. She also has done significant work around anti-racism and scholarship and advocacy uh, and is co coordinating Black Futures Program to, to actually build a pipeline, if you will, for Black uh, schools, kids, um, and she's the author of the book, Taking Black Control, African-Canadian Teachers' Lives and Practice, which was the first book of its kind in Canadian universities. Next slide, please. And our third speaker rounding out the, the hat trick, if you will, is Executive Director for the Catalyst Canada, Dr. Julie Caffley, who in 2023 was chosen as a member of the, the Canadian delegation to the UN, the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, she was. She has previously served as chief of staff for two University of Ottawa presidents. She has, is a strategic leader, accomplished academic, has written significantly on public policy governance, also on women and leadership, about uh, a pre the presidential mandates, and also recently on, on, on queer leadership in Canadian universities. So this, our presenters will go in that order. And now I turn the floor over to Candace. Dr. Candice uh, Burnett. Wachie Misue, Wabin Gizis Nindish Nakazwin, Maskego Ininu Esquayo, Pidebek Nintonjin. Many thanks 
uh, to Dr. Melinda Smith, whom I've been a long time fan. So I'm really um, just honored to be here to share with you today and for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Thank you to the team. Uh, as, as indicated, my name is Candace Burnett de Bossigay. I'm an Indigenous Cree woman from Peterbeck First Nation in Treaty 9 territory. And I have a complex, like all of us, uh, positionality. I'm an urban uh, Indigenous woman, cisgendered with Cree and French lineage. I'm a mother, an academic, and a lifelong learner of Indigenous Cree and Anishinaabe ways of knowing and decolonizing my practice. I come to you today from the Deshkan Zibing territory of the Great Lakes region of Turtle Island in London, Ontario, what's now called London, Ontario, in uh, Canada, of course, home to the Anishinaabek, Ongwe Owe, and Lenapewak people. I want to pay some respect to the land. Um, our Mother Earth, the living being who continuously provides to us despite our human species' utter inability to see, feel, and understand our, our very important interdependency and connection to her. I just want to take a moment to say that um, I'm grateful for the land and renewing this relationship with the land is like the single most important issue of our time. And I think it pays, um, it has connection to the work that Indigenous peoples can do in universities. Over the last eight years, I've become very interested in the role, relationships and responsibilities that westernized universities have to Indigenous peoples of the lands that they occupy and grow themselves on, and what is into understanding what is the role of universities in sustaining Indigenous knowledges in our teaching, research, and leadership. And my desire to do this comes from my lived experience in sitting in almost every role in the university. I've been a student, of course, staff member, an administrator, and more recently a faculty member. And I've struggled to find meaningful space to be Indigenous in these spaces and to bridge the long, long divides that continue to exist between communities, Indigenous communities and the university. Indigenous peoples have been not um, historically and legally even permitted to, to go to university until quite recently uh, when we look at the, 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 the big picture. Uh, but we've been fighting and advocating for changes in universities for well over five decades. Since the release of the TRC, we've started to see some steps finally taken to better include Indigenous peoples and knowledges throughout the system. And Mi'kmaq scholar Michelle Pigeon in 2016 coined this movement as part of an institutional Indigenization movement. And this has resulted in the creation of Indigenous senior offices that report to presidents and provosts and senior Indigenous administrative roles. Interestingly, many of these positions are occupied by Indigenous women. A 2019 survey conducted by the Academic Women's Association actually reported 1.2% uh, of senior leaders in universities are Indigenous or were Indigenous at that time. And this number has increased over the years, there's no doubt about it. Um, but when you think of the larger population of Indigenous peoples being closer to 6% of the overall national population, you can see that 1.2 is still very low. And we continue to be chronically underrepresented, not just at that level, but in, in, the, in the professoriate continues to be a challenge uh, and among students. And like Melinda, Dr. Smith has alluded to, the numbers alone don't tell the whole story. They don't speak to the experience of Indigenous women in university leadership, which is the focus of my research and the book, Tricky Grounds, which will be released by the University of Regina Press in January. And this work builds on my doctoral work that focused on the experiences of early Indigenous women administrators who were called to champion reconciliation between 2017 and 2020. 
At the time um, of my research, media reports, you might remember, started to shine a light on some negative experiences that some women were facing taking on these new roles. There were two high profile cases that caught my attention at that time around premature resignations of Indigenous women at the University of Manitoba. That was the first Vice Provost Indigenous position and then the first Dean of Law at Lakehead University. And both these women actually went public with their experiences and talked about how they faced systemic racism in trying to lead indigenization work. So my study is really interested in stories like these. Um, it's based in indigenous paradigm and indigenous methodological approach to research. I gather stories of 12 indigenous women across Canada in varying types of roles. And really the purpose was to understand leadership and undo the deafening silence in leadership studies generally, but in, in, um, in the field of indigenization and decolonization as well, and, and hopefully contribute to deepening our understandings of what universities need to do to change. So I'm gonna begin um, by sharing some narratives from the book. These quotes are based on resonant themes shared by women who I interviewed and I analyzed obviously these interviews in different ways. These narratives are fictionalized and I do this to protect uh, the anonymity of women that I sat with because this is contentious ground. Uh, I form one character in, in the book. Um, in one of the chapters, I uh, there is a play that, that has three characters. This is the one character, Maria Thunderchild. She's a fictitious character in, in the play. There is another character uh, by, the name, uh, by the name of Heather, who is another indigenous uh, woman administrator. And then there's Wisagi Chuck, who is a Cree cultural hero from my own uh, storytelling traditions, who comes to help kind of drive the storytelling process in an indigenous way. So this is a different, uh, kind of research and sharing of stories. So bear with me here. I will be reading stage notes a little bit, so hopefully you can follow. Wisagichuk. Wisagichuk transforms into a photographer, taking Maria's photo for the local press. A little to the left, right. No, back to the left. Yes, right there. Smile, a little happier. That's it. Snap. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Maria's walking and her iPhone alerts her to news feeds that appear on the screen on stage. The University of Canada appoints Maria Thunderchild as special advisor, Indigenous Initiatives, a historic moment for the university, signaling its commitment to reconciliation. Maria. Being the Indigenous face of reconciliation is not quite what I bargained for. It's a surreal feeling to come to become the epitome of the solution and the problem at the same time. Reconciliation commitment, com commitments and all sorts of promises, but you still get the feeling that you're there, but you don't quite fit in. Maybe it's the way people look at you, the assumptions they make, about how you got the job, what you don't know, the ways they include you and don't, or just forget. You try to make change, to be heard in the university, use the facts, reference university policy, develop new ones, revamp old ones, assert rights, legislation, constitution, OCAP, UNDRIP, if you bring in the right evidence, like statistics, quantitative surveys, literature, but you weigh in and you get overlooked, dismissed, ignored, labeled a problem, you talk too much or with that tone, you're too political, don't do that, what's this? You start thinking, maybe I'm being too sensitive. Maybe I'm just overreacting. Eventually you start getting fed up. Then the words start feeling empty. Sometimes you start worrying that HR and security will some someday walk you to the door and you'll vanish into the night. Not a word of how or why, just erased. 
My research findings point to the challenges that Indigenous women face doing reconciliation work in the university and how institutional indigenization work is deeply gendered, colonial, and even racialized. In an academic context, Indigenous women are placed into impossible positions where they're often talked about feeling caught at the intersection of three vines. Working in an acad academic context that's dominated by Western thought and administrative, scientific, bureaucratic assumptions of change and leadership. Two, leading in a leadership profession that's dominated by white male assumptions of what good leadership looks like. Good leadership is often assumed to be objective, assertive, and often apolitical, neutral. So when women don't fit into these norms, they get questioned, they get dismissed and casted as difficult or not collegial, even activist. This weighs on them. And finally, the third bind is that Indigenous women doing institutional change work, like institutional indigenization, uh, this, this space can be quite dangerous and contentious because they're challenging the norms of the university and they're operating on a type of borderland, a borderland between Euro-Western institutional powers and Indigenous communities, as well as Western knowledges and um, Indigenous ways of knowing. So I'm going to end with one more of the quotes uh, by Maria, the narratives. Embodying reconciliation promises comes at a cost. Daily triggers, emotional loads, it takes a toll on your well-being. Relationships with family and community, you can suddenly start feeling distant from them. Some people don't treat you the same anymore. Some people call you a traitor, even assimilated. The load gets heavy, and after a while, you find yourself questioning everything if you're not careful. Indigenous women describe the sense of being caught between these paradoxical positions inside struct these structures of the administration. There was an emotional load that they often talked about that was invisible. And the emotional load came from moving in and out of different ways, different contexts and ways of working on the borderland, which was very exhausting for them. This caused them not to be at ease also in the administrative context, and there was a sense of ambivalence around their work. There was also a sense of being othered within. So although they were part of the administration, they often talked about not feeling quite accepted or belonged there, and this was painful. It was also painful when they, they started to sense that sometimes Indigenous communities didn't no longer see them as part of the community. So this created a dissonance for how they saw themselves and how others saw them. There was a sense of being questioned and doubted because they came from their indigeneity and that they were assumed to be biased and unable to be um, to make decisions without letting that bias interfere. There was a sense of being hyper visibilized because they were the one and only, but also and isolated, but then at the same time tokenized, being expected to speak for all indigenous. Indigenous peoples, and this came with a sense of scrutiny. And finally, I will finish up here, uh, being labeled radical. This was ever so present in the stories that women shared, especially if they resisted the norms of the university. They were casted in uh, the classic colonial tropes um, as being difficult, militant, and divisive. I'm going to finish that up here by just uh, reinstating that um, these simplistic positionings of, um, you know, positioning Indigenous peoples as either or, either for the the um, the the uh, working in the university, they, they they recognize that there's a recognition of complicity working in an institution, but I think we need to challenge ourselves to think more nuancedly about Indigenous women's work in the university, and it's not either or for the university or against the university. And when we start to position women in this way, uh, we, we 
we actually um, undermine the agency and the complexity of the work and the gendered nature of all of the things that I've just shared. So I will end there and look forward to conversations further. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Henry. Thank you very much. Good, okay. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this Courageous Conversation series. I'm speaking to you today, speaking with you today um, from the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Musqueam people. The four, there are four agreements of co co Courageous Conversations according to Glenn Singleton, who wrote um, a book called Courageous Conversations in 2007. And the second is the second agreement is expect to experience discomfort. And um, I'm going to raise some questions about diversity, inclusion, and leadership, and and uh, they may be a bit uncomfortable. As James Baldwin has said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Diversity, inclusion, leadership, these are terms that um, have many meanings, they carry many meanings and people use them differently <clears throat> in different contexts. One of the things that I like to um, remind myself of is that leadership takes place in various forms and occurs not only in formal positions with a title. Sometimes people are quite effective uh, as leaders outside the formal mechanisms of the university. And I say that because it takes all of us to transform a university. Uh, leaders have their role with their um, visionary um, ideas and uh, actions and ability to uh, bring things into fruition, um, but it, it takes all of us. And people take on le leadership positions for various reasons, as we know. Um, you know, sometimes it's basically um, being in the right place at the right time, moving up the ladder, making a few dollars. Uh, but we're, we want to talk about people who are leaders who make transformative differences. As we take on leadership positions in, in a desire to make positive changes or bring in new ideas in needed areas, one might ask which perspectives and whose perspectives are allowed to be taken up? Do these ideas unsettle the status quo? As a black female, for example, can one accomplish her goals in the same way as perhaps a black male or a black or a white male or female? It is a lovely time in the university and a lot of exciting things are happening everywhere. And I'm sure uh, variations of the same thing are happening all over the country. <clears throat> you know, um, uh, more um, money is being committed to um, to black students, to anti-black racism, to hiring black faculty. And uh, potentially we have more opportunities for black leadership. And I'm personally thrilled to see faces that look like me at the University of British Columbia. And for years, uh, there were just two of us black females. Um, so it's a hopeful time. Uh, but we have more diversity and um, Dr. Smith talked a lot about the, the value of diversity, but are we really inclusive? Can we talk about inclusive leadership when the institutions that we work in are not inclusive? How do we restructure the university so that um, we can work against the structural inequalities that are normative, that are normalized throughout the university. And that as um, the previous speaker, Dr. Candice mentioned, um, uh, um, inhibit the kinds of visions that women go into leadership for in the first place, indigenous women, racialized women, women generally. Um, 
so we we know that institutions uh, reproduce inequalities, and as uh, David Gilborn has said, beneath a facade of meritocracy and colorblindness. Well, the colorblindness not so much today, because it seems that now um, in universities across the country, um, diversity has been a kind of is, is a kind of a cultural capital. And it feels good to us in a way to say, oh, we have an indigenous dean or we have you know, a racialized um, senior advisor to the provost, for example. But we have to be careful uh, not to reproduce the cultural taxation or the burden of diversity as Jolanda Jackson calls it, or more specifically, the burden of being indigenous or black or um, Asian or, uh, you know, disabled even, we don't talk about disability enough. Are we relegating, and I'm talking a lot about black people, um, <clears throat> but are we relegating black people or racialized people only to leadership positions in EDI at the exclusion of say executive leadership positions? Um, and I think Do Dr. Smith had a slide that that um, alluded to this somewhat. Um, granted, you know, the, these very people bring an invaluable knowledge and lived experience to those positions and a desire as well. One of the things that I found interesting at the beginning of the year was American research, but Donna Edwards, a former uh, Democratic Congresswoman, showed re American research that showed that EDI positions were being created after George Floyd, but quote, slowed to a call or even reversed or have slowed to a call or even reverse. And I'm just wondering what that means. Um, does it mean that things are getting better? Um, I, I, I don't know, but I, I want to mention that. And I had talked to a friend at a Toronto university recently and she said, oh, we don't even talk about EDI anymore. We're done, we're done with EDI, which was interesting. I don't have a comment on that. I just am throwing that out there because it would be nice to have a conversation on this. Institutional transformation is a collective effort. Uh, and of course, uh, we need good leaders to help us with that. As um, Vice President for Strategic Affairs and Diversity, Manar Pratt has written, transformative change in higher education requires scholars to be activists and activists to be scholars, unafraid to speak and give voice to justice and equality in all settings and all circumstances. And she talks about uh, leadership as activism. I've spoken to many um, activist scholar um, colleagues, black women mostly, who dismiss the idea or the aspiration of leadership, believing that their scholarship and activist activities would suffer too much. And the ability to move in ways that make the kinds of changes needed might be thwarted by institutional pressures. So how can we foster leadership that is diverse, inclusive, and transformative? What are the possibilities to not only be a leader and have courageous conversations, but also uh, courageous actions within the institution? Um, given, as Candace has mentioned, we're working in the colonial, structures and how how do people want to change this how much do people want to change the status quo once we get into those positions or how much can they really um how can we give leaders from a range of backgrounds and lived experience and and people struggling with life circumstances the supports they need so that they can do the innovative things they dream about when they step up as leaders there's no shortage of research literature and first person narratives to show um, that, um, and I'm speaking as a black woman again, that black women are erased, diminished, harassed in the trajectory from assistant to full professor and into leadership. So why would one aspire to leadership? A black woman, a, a vice president of equity told me in 2007, when I was still living in the US, uh, these jobs kill black women, she said. Despite a serious autoimmune disease, she's still doing the work and she's now a university chancellor, obviously quite successful. But that conversation remained with me and as and I reflect upon it when I read um, 
memoirs such as Rosemary Brown, the, polit uh, the uh, politician Rosemary Brown's memoir, where she delineates the chronic stresses of leadership in public and political life, from loneliness and depression to um, you know, bladder, gallbladder, eye, skin problems, and a brain tumor. And Annette Kolodny, who was a dean for five years at the University of Arizona, writes, I, I had become physically sick and I could no longer mask my growing disabilities. The fact that she says she had to mask them uh, makes me wonder, um, you know, how inclusive are we being? Uh, she delineates how from year to year her health declined um, and she would be very adept at making excuses. Um, for example, the provost would want to meet for breakfast meeting at 6.30 in the morning, but she she had to soak her joints for an hour in the tub so that she could move them. So she she was really had very crippling arthritis. So thinking about inclusive leadership, um, what kinds of conditions uh, would, would have made her um, deanship um, much more tolerable and much more enjoyable. Uh, the demands of leadership have also changed over the last 20 years, I think. Rarely do administrators engage in academic publishing the way they used to. And it seems it seems that you have to make a choice, an either or choice. Um, and, you know, we spend so much time um, uh, working in our, in our research and um, and then we just leave it behind. That's that's a conundrum for some of us. I remember my assigned coach at the UBC Academic Leadership Development Program dropped into my office one day and she scorned the fact that I was preparing for a research conference. And she said to me, you don't need to do that anymore. You're an administrator. And I raised this because it was such a dilemma for academics um, who see the need for change within the institution and know the importance of their presence at the decision-making tables and uh, yet believe their work is a form of act activism and changing the conversation, changing knowledge production, and also you know, changing the historical archive. So that, that, that's been a conundrum for me, I have to say, of, for the last couple of years, where um, when nominated for positions, I decline because I have a longitudinal study that seems to be more longitudinal than I would like it to be. Um, so we're, we're also living in a, in a different time uh, in terms of um, how we view work. And even before the pandemic, sociologists of work have been saying that um, the people are no longer prepared to put in the long hours that their parents did. Uh, people today are talking more about work-life balance and um, uh, whether or not they manage to do that successfully. So what does that mean for the demands of leadership for the long hours, for the evening meetings, for the 6.30 a.m. breakfast meetings and so forth? How can we foster inclusive leadership amongst potential leaders who are racialized? Um, also, when communities have collective cultural memories and stories of institutional betrayals, that may affect their willingness to lead. So when I first came to the University of British Columbia, there were these veiled um, statements that people in the black community would say, would say to me. And I got the sense that they had not had a good experience at UBC 30 years prior, but they didn't want to come out and really say it. But there's this collective kind of memory of, oh, you're at B UBC now, oh, what are they doing up there? You know, there's pain in there. So how, how do we, those things stay within a community for a while. So how do we turn that around? And lastly, what kinds of self-examination and preparatory work do we need to do in our universities um, to help create an environment in which people from a range of backgrounds and lived experiences feel invited to, um, to give a voice and become leaders in their universities. Thank you. And now I'd like to pass this on to Dr. Julie Caffrey. Thank you for that. Thank you, Annette. Thanks, Melinda, Candice. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Caffley. I'm the Executive Director at Catalyst Canada. We've been driving in inclusion in um, workplaces um, across the world globally for the past 60 years, and we support uh, 200 corporations here in Canada. Um, I'm calling in today from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe uh, Algonquin peoples and um, acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, Candace mentioned the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We're approaching the 10 year anniversary and the last the number that I saw, uh, we've checked off um, 13 of the 94 calls to action. So our collective report card on reconciliation is sitting at about 14% and um, with a bunch of academics in the room today. I know what you all think about a 14% um, report card. Melinda's video at the beginning uh, mentioned the work of, of this conversation and, and a lot of what was prompted um, since George Floyd's murder three years ago. And I think it's an important, uh, it's an important reminder. And Catalyst recently did um, a piece of research um, interviewing, uh, sorry, uh, surveying um, employees in corporations um, uh, across globally within Canada as well. And basically the response was 75% of employees felt that the work of their organization in terms of racial equity work was performative. So that's also not a very good number in terms of a report card. And I think it's really important to look at that, you know, looking inside your organization three years forward, um, are we talking about George Floyd in speeches and are we actually delivering in terms of changing the experience uh, for Black employees, for Black leaders, for racialized employees and racialized leaders more broadly. So a lot of good um, thoughts and, and some really scary numbers, frankly, in terms of, of how we're doing in this realm. I did lean into the, the word courageous when Melinda mentioned it was a courageous conversation. I'm going to be very um, frank and, and a little bit um, jarring in terms of, of some of the numbers that I'll share and some of the experiences. But before starting, I really want to applaud, recognize and celebrate the lived experience, the emotional tax uh, that both, you know, that Melinda, Annette and Candace shared so candidly with all of us today. Um, I sat listening to every word and, and feeling the weight of their experiences as I listened to them. And I celebrate and applaud their, their courage and their leadership um, because it takes a toll, as Annette mentioned. Um, about 20 years ago, Catalyst coined the term emotional tax, and that's the bracing, uh, the heightened experience of being different from peers at work because of your gender, your race, your ethnicity, um, or other dimensions of intersectionality. And it has an effect on health, it has an effect on well-being and um, your ability to thrive at work. And students, professors, staff members um, who are racialized um, across our country are living with this emotional tax uh, on a daily basis in our universities and our colleges. And um, what are we doing about it? You know, how are we acknowledging it? How are we, we preventing it? How are we um, not tokenizing? How are we supporting individuals who are being called upon again and again to do this work that has a, a huge emotional charge? Um, our recent research on emotional tax um, talks about more than half of women from uh, marginalized racial and ethnic groups uh, talk about being on guard to bias and discrimination in their work teams on a daily basis. So this is this is real and it's something that we don't talk about a lot. And it really struck me today in terms of hearing our other speakers. Um, and of course, every level, level of intersectionality increases that number. So when you have a racialized woman who identifies as 2SLGBTQ or as trans, this number goes higher and higher and higher. Uh, for racialized trans women uh, in Canada, you're looking at upwards of 85% in terms of the emotional tax um, experience. This is hard work. And um, I, I think we really need to start acknowledging it a lot more. Um, we also came up with some research recently focusing on racism in the workplace. Once again, this is within corporations, not within the university sector. However, I think that there's many parallels that can be drawn. Uh, more than half uh, talk about experiencing racism in their uh, daily work lives. We talk about this, this white default that exists within the workplaces. All of our speakers today uh, referenced it as well. I would, might go on to say a white male default and how do our um, racialized employees, racialized leaders 
transform and adapt and react and appease to fit into that white norm. And frankly, um, there's a lot that needs to be acknowledged and a lot that needs to be done there as well. Um, on the courageous side of things, I think uh, in terms of my work over the past uh, year and a bit at Catalyst, I find Canada to be a little bit smug on questions of EDI. Um, we do a lot of things right, and we should be proud of a lot of the work that we do. And yet there is a lot of this hidden racism, sexism. I don't like to say there's no, no racism is polite, but kind of this, this, this racism that exists within Canada that we're not talking about and not acknowledging and this DEI backlash that we're seeing um, across the country. When it comes to universities, um, I have really high expectations. I've worked in a university. I care deeply about universities. Um, I think in terms of the research that they're driving in this area, it's so exciting and so leading edge. And yet in terms of turning that mirror on themselves, there's so much more to do. And so I would frankly say that universities have a whole other level of smugness in terms of uh, the experiences of equity as employees, as um, as professors, as staff members within universities. Um, and uh, I think we need to talk about that. And I think that um, we need to acknowledge that and we need to, to, to really have important conversations like today about that. In terms of my PhD research, um, Linda mentioned it briefly at the beginning. It did focus um, more on women, but also racialized leaders as well. Essentially, I looked at the role of university president um, about a quarter uh, to 30% of university presidents in Canada are women. Um, unfortunately, in terms of those who don't finish their first term as university president, so who are um, who don't complete that first first five years of their term, we're looking at upwards of 65 to 75 percent of those leaders that are women. So essentially, they're being hired less and fired more often um, in terms of that experience. Um, it's a huge concern. Um, I refer to it as, you know, unconscious bias in times of crisis. I had a colleague call me out on that recently and said, why aren't you calling it outright racism or sexism that's existing? And why are you giving the excuse of it being unconscious bias? And perhaps I do use unconscious bias because I, I, I hope and I believe that universities um, have the ability to, to, to look at the situation differently and to get to a point of really acknowledging that bias as it needs to be done. What's really um, upsetting to me in this discussion is um, Canada is falling behind and yet the rest of the world is really starting to, to shine. Um, we all know that uh, Harvard um, has their first black woman president. Um, this is something that they've been working on for the past 30 to 40 years. They've had a strategy, they've had a plan, they've been working on um, undoing uh, bias and undoing uh, certain realities within their, their institution to help prepare for this. Six out of the eight Ivy League universities right now are being led by women, Berkeley, MIT, um, uh, in, the, in, in the UK, LSE, Oxford, Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, so there's some really shining examples of, of women leaders um, across the world. In Canada, um, we have two of our U15 leaders who are women right now, um, Sophie Demour at Laval and Kim Brooks at Dalhousie. Um, but we really fall short. And, um, you know, 13% of our, our U15 leaders are women. If you look at the sector more broadly, um, look at the leaders of Universities Canada, U15, SHRC, CIHR, CIHR NSERC, um, NRC, MITAX, Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, it's a small group of people who look very, very similar to each other. They talk alike, they make decisions in a similar manner, and they're literally leading the whole sector. Um, so some important discussions there. They don't take pictures together often, as you might have noticed, because it becomes a bit embarrassing and might go uh, a bit viral like the House of Home Commons uh, Health Committee did last week. So people might just say that's just the numbers. Um, there's lots of good that's happening. There's absolutely lots of good that's happening. There's some amazing male allies amongst those leaders who are really advancing things in an important way. Um, but there are some, some concerns. Um, I was recently at a meeting of university presidents. I was speaking to a male president and I said, oh, I said, I've got to go. I'm going to a, a meeting with the, the women university presidents who are getting together. And he said, oh, yeah, he goes, you know, they like to get together every now and then and have a bit of a therapy session together. 
pretty demeaning to a group of, of colleagues and peers um, who are women and, and doing the same job as you. I was at another session with university leaders where one of the speakers referred to um, microaggressions that faculty members commit to staff in university campuses, um, thousands of them, he said, on a daily basis, and the whole room erupted in laughter. And all I could think about is the corporations that we're working with at Catalyst, and if people were to laugh about microaggressions in any of those corporations, people would be fired on the spot. Um, so the fact that, that that was laughed at in a university context uh, gives me a great uh, deal of concern as well. So in terms of where to go, you know, we know this stuff. You know, any of the speakers on our um, call can talk to you openly about this. You need a concrete plan. It needs to be central to strategy. You need data, metrics, accountability. It needs to be measured. We have to stop celebrating the idea of diversity and actually driving change on diversity. And we need to share the numbers, whether they're good or bad, and we need to have a plan moving forward. Uh, Harvard has something that I speak about quite often called culture carriers where they'll actually have um, independent observers sitting in on Senate and board meetings and saying at the end of a meeting, oh, do you realize that 17 women were interrupted during this call uh, today? Or do you realize that a student presented this idea, it was ignored and yet presented by the dean 10 minutes later and, and that dean was given credit for this idea. So how are all of these um, unconscious uh, biases happening in our meetings and how are we actually undoing those deep changes that are needed um, in terms of cultural changes? You know, what does true allyship look like? How are, um, you know, white male leaders stepping out of the way, frankly, and, and, um, and creating opportunities for others? And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about Catalyst. How do we focus? You know, we don't need uh, women or racialized leaders to be mentored more, to be sponsored more. We actually don't need them to change. We need to change structures to create space for these leaders. Um, yes, of course, mentorship and sponsorship can help, um, but we really need to change the structures and not the people. Uh, the people have everything that they need and much, much more. And uh, how do we create that space uh, for them? So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for joining today. And uh, back to you, Melinda. Thanks, okay, I'm having a hard time turning my video on. So I'm hoping they, <laughs> who has it? Okay, there we go. Um, thank you very much to all three of our presenters for a fantastic conversation. And, I, I, and from the comments I'm receiving, I can tell you that the audience is quite engaged by it and are very appreciative by all the contributions. And, and, and I guess, I mean, there are, so one is the question of what we didn't talk about and how we wanna talk about the intersection of age in our conversation. Um, but another conversation relates to whether in fact there is more change at the level of, say, if you're in a department, in a university, at the level of the department and, and the faculty, and then why isn't that, why doesn't that move up when you get into more senior leadership? So I, I'll, I'll start with those two questions and then we'll come back to, to several others. The question of age. Um, and, and, and for those of you who haven't seen the data, I mean, you know, uh, StatsCan just released their full professor data uh, maybe in the last couple of weeks, where they highlighted that you know since the removal of mandatory uh, retirement in the in the in the two thousands, in fact that a significant I think maybe a quarter of men professors, for example, full professors, um, are, are, are over sixty five, and that um, so how does that shape full professorship? fewer women at the full professorship level, but also less spaces in the university because a significant percentage are held by people who can continue since uh, they don't have to retire. Is that a form of ageism to even raise that question? How do we think about ageism in this context, particularly given it shapes diversity? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll start there. Uh, I I, I would say uh, just um, I I think the the question in the chat was more about students um, 
uh, if I if I understand correctly. So I don't want to lose that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple. There's a couple of them that intersect. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. But but it, it uh, definitely so. I mean, it's it's an observation that I'm I'm sure we've all made uh, that, uh, and it's in the data that um, you know, usually the men retire uh, these days a lot later. I mean, I think we have somebody in their 80s, very productive, still writing books, you know, uh, so it's, it's, he's not just hanging around, <laughs> you know, uh, really productive, but it does make a difference. And I also think it's very gendered. I think that, uh, you know, um, and I'm sure there must be data, I don't have it at hand, but I think it's very gendered, gendered that, that uh, w women would not, to stay on in their 80s as much um and so uh, you know i think i think it's i think it's a question to ask because you know it, for years and years and years for example in my department we didn't have an assistant professor and so it's also then it also creates a kind of a cl little club you don't get fresh ideas coming in and so it's a lovely time now because we're doing much more hiring and we're getting uh people with different perspectives uh fresh ideas um, and I think that's that's part of being a university, that you have a diversity, of, as you mentioned in the beginning, a diversity, not only of, you know, colors, but uh, of ideas, backgrounds, lived experiences and so forth. So I think it it's it's something to think about, you know, <clears throat> and even just the reality of when I remember when I was uh, a student at OISE at University of Toronto, that there, there was um, there was a sort of a mass retirement because there was an incentive, there was a financial incentive. And we don't do those things as much these days, so it's it's causing um, you know um, uh, people to stay longer. Yeah, and I and I just think if this is this is perhaps rambling a little, I don't want to take too much time, but you know when you spend most of your life focusing on one thing all the time you sometimes you don't have a balanced enough life to think oh there are other things in life that I can do you can't imagine doing other things Candice I think you have, thank you very much I think Candice mm -hmm. you had your hand up yeah yeah I mean I don't know if I can speak to the age factor necessarily from a from like um, a research standpoint like when it came when it came to looking at leadership for Indigenous peoples in universities, there's very little data I'm, um, on on Indigenous uh, peoples. It's quite you know we're only starting to gather it, um, but the data for this particular group is really interesting because it's it's not it's not like other groups. Like you would think that Indigenous men are really well represented, and and actually Indigenous men aren't represented very very high in in the leadership data at all. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the professoriate, we have, you know, a long way to go to be able to penetrate that. And, and that has a huge implication in dis academic decision making. And, uh, you know, I, I often worry about that because we are, we're putting such a, a focus in getting people into formal administration on the administrative side of the house. But what about, you know, uh, building our leadership? And like, you know, Dr. Henry has alluded to, and I think it's really important, like thinking about leadership more broadly than just the formal types of roles. And that that goes to point from an Indigenous standpoint, um, we have a lot of communities that are locally based that do a lot of labor for our institutions. They sit on committees, they participate, and they're not employees, they're not students, and they're not staff or faculty members, but they're community partners. And how are we thinking about how they contribute to our institutions and to the work that we're doing? And what often happens with Indigenous peoples is we're so marginalized. We're so small that we don't even get reported. And that's called the hysterics. I don't think I always say that word wrong. Phenomena. It's been happening for years and it drives me batty because the numbers are so low that it would identify someone. So then they don't report them at all. And that happens all the time and it just continues the problem that we have. So there's, I think we have to think about each group too differently. And I really liked the work that the uh, Women's Association was doing on like non-binary and intersectional analysis. I think we needed to be doing way more of that and that might get to the um, the person's question around age is, are we, are we even at, I don't know, Dr. Smith, are we, are we looking at age? in some of those metrics that we're gathering? I'm not sure. Sorry. Uh, we could say more about a a age 
in there, but I, I think that the research, I'm gonna let uh, 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 Dr. Kathleen get into there. Part, the, there is a, the, the age is, a, but there's gonna be a bias, gonna be a bias against uh, senior, uh, senior women. Yeah. Rather than senior men. Because I don't see this being raised as often uh, with senior men. It's it's like, uh, it, and so in fact, the first case in the, it was, was brought by a woman around the retirement, but I think the beneficiaries, the main beneficiaries have been men. So I'm gonna let Dr. Uh, Dr. Kathleen uh, respond because I have some other questions where I wanna push you all to be even more courageous in your conversation. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The, the only thing I would add uh, to my colleagues is the question around tenure and, and in terms of the system itself. Um, you know, when I was working in a university, we did roundtables and the word um, back from the professoriate was, you know, um, men will typically apply for tenure three years before they're ready and men three, uh, women three years after they're ready. Um, mm -hmm. So right from the outset, you're having, um, you know, a, a, a difference there. You know, how do we look at, I know that many universities have adapted their tenure process for Indigenous scholars as well. Is that being done enough? How are we looking at inclusivity through the tenure process, which is really, you know, such a cornerstone to the to the role of professor? And how does that impact in terms of of age and um, the the growth within one's career? So for me, it's more questions than answers. But I think that's you know an interesting system to look at. So we've had we're having this discussion about numbers. Representation matters, but underrepresentation persists. We're having the discussion about experiences. So the, the, the one and only, the handful, the few, who, if you take uh, uh, Dr. Henry's comment, most don't want to go into it because they don't see it. They don't see it as something to look up to. It's not a good experience. So the, so the representation matters, underrepresented. Experiences matter, the experiences from what, we all know to be true, if even if not uh, widely reported, the experiences aren't great. Hmm. And in fact, people are more likely to leave wounded than discuss it. Hmm. So are we, what is it, so what, what do we need to do to make, to draw attention to this reality? Because the, the, the other side of this is, if people don't see us in those roles, they think we are underqualified, we aren't available, we aren't ready. So there's twofold question. The assumptions, the deficit thinking on the one side, but what is it about the culture? Let's talk more about, the, about how homogeneity, how more about uh, um, sameness is an injustice mm -hmm. and actually whether, I'm going to push it even further, if diversity fuels ingenuity, innovation, creativity, this homogeneity, is, is homogeneity an impediment to these things? So you could pick any angle of those questions you want. Who wants to start? Julie, I'm going to throw it to you. You're in yeah, cattle. So this, this is really um, in my sweet spot in terms of my PhD in particular, because basically what we're saying is, you know, women in leadership roles and racialized leaders are more at risk. It's it's a it's statistics. It's looking at the numbers. They're more at risk. If you look at, you know, Wab Kanu as our new um, premier in Manitoba, if you're looking at Greg Fergus as the first black speaker of the house, these leaders are more at risk. And so how are we talking about that? How are we supporting um, in terms of the work that I do on university presidents? How are we teaching boards that the leader that they have chosen, if they're, cho they're choosing um, a leader with intersectional, um, you know, different layers of intersectionality, that this actually does affect their leadership from a very statistical perspective? And how is that leadership being supported? How do we talk about unconscious bias in moments of crisis so that we actually have a plan and we're actually aware of what occurs and we can we can have a plan um, to deal with that? So I think it's it's a really important discussion to have, and it's it needs to happen obviously before you know there's issues that occur. And you know we see this in women in politics all of the time. You know men are not reelected; they can go on and get prestigious international appointments and go on and have quite you know uh, beautiful careers afterwards. And uh, women you know fall out of grace in a different way. Um, and there's been a lot of work that's been done on this in particular. So so how are we understanding those dimensions of leadership and how are we counteracting? 
anyone wants to talk more about the implications of being the one and only or uh, the, the, the uh, uh, homogeneity, the implications of homogeneity? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to, to challenge it, and I don't have an answer here, but it's like, what what is the problem? You know, we often, when, when we come at, at it from a rep, and I don't think that's what I'm hearing people here say, but what we have historically come at, at this issue with is like representation is enough. And it's, it's a deeper, it's a deeper problem, right? It's a system problem, which I think we're starting to recognize now, but it's a paradigm shift. And, and the dominance of, uh, scientific reasoning and positivism and like all of that really needs to needs to shift. It's like an epistemological sort of uh, tension um, that we need we need to shift that. And by bringing not just bodies but diverse knowledges and not just knowledges where we like objectively look at them and read them, but like we enact them, we live them. That's why with indigenous knowledge, it's not just a knowledge; it's a way of being. Um, and it's very, uh, it's very challenging, like we're reclaiming our knowledges and, and, and indigenous women who I sat with, including myself, like you struggle, you know, it's do, do, how can you be uh, taken seriously in certain spaces and we struggle going in and out of spaces and I think it's so courageous when we are who we are and we don't conform. And that comes that's an internal thing but um, that's something that I'm trying to work on on a micro level every day is like not succumbing to uh, fitting the mold of what, you know, is credible and is taken seriously in spaces like this, you know, the, and, 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 and I'm always trying to, to decolonize my own way of thinking. Um, and we need to do more of that and celebrate that um, in all its different forms, um, because that's, what's going to shift. But Again, like how does change happen? Uh, you know, th there's there was this big tension in the research that I did around that. Uh, is it radical rehaul? Like, <laughs> is it incremental? You know, how how do we go about this? I do believe policies have a huge have a huge um, currency in in institutions. I worry about how we're going to start measuring equity policies um, in very narrow positivist ways. And I, I think we have to, as leaders, you know, of the this kind of movement, really think about broadening the what does it look like to be successful in these and and go beyond the the, the representation data or you know the typical things that you see. So there's diverse ways of knowing represented in how we're measuring it. Yeah. So I I'd like to um I'll say a couple of words about both the only one and um, what was your other, um, I guess, uh, or homogeneity. Yeah. Um, I've always been the only one. It's it's actually, you know, a new experience for me not to be the only one, I think, uh, right now at UBC. Um, but or, or going through elementary school, always the only one, the only one, the only one. So, I, it's you know, I've sort of never... Um, expected to fit in. I just do my thing. Um, however, um, you know, it 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 doesn't mean it's not painful at times. Um, and uh, I would say, um, I I I just had maybe the parents I had, but but to look at this, this is not my problem. You know, um, this is not my problem, and I'm not. You know, it's it's his problem or their problem. Uh, but with the insider business, it it can be really difficult. And I found, um, you know, that, um, I, you know, I, I, again, you know, you don't want to you don't want to indict your colleagues. But let's just say that often universities hire their own. So there's a lot of insiderness on so many levels. Right. So you hire your graduate students. Uh, maybe they are the top candidate, but you know that if that keeps going on, it's it it creates a kind of a a, a a a smaller community than we would like. So that creates a problem in terms of ways of thinking, and I think you know you've alluded to that already. So then, when when somebody like me comes in, uh, you know that there's a lack of trust. Um, I mean, I was literally told you, you're not from here. Um, you know, we belong here. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that can happen to people who are, you know, very nice, but and and are not conscious of what they're really, really saying. 
right? And, uh, and it, you know, we have to admit that we live in a white supremacist society and, uh, and most people have not examined what that really means. And so um, just totally unconscious of what they're really saying. Uh, so, so that's what makes it, you know, really hard to change the structures. I mean, I, I think it's it's only recently that I felt that people could actually name race, and maybe it's the post George Floyd. But you know, I would find that people would would you know turn all shades of red if they if they were speaking to me and they and they they would sort of mutter around. They wanted to say the word black, or they wouldn't know what to say, or. Uh, African Canadian, are you African? You know, they would muddle around it so much, you know. And 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 I think to have those courageous conversations. Remember, we were trying to hire an indigenous woman or an indigenous. It was an indigenous hire. Let's just say it. But I don't think we'd gotten that far. And I said, well, how? What kind of? What kind of environment are we bringing this person to? And there was a dead silence in the room. Nobody said anything. And then after the meeting, they said, oh yeah, Annette, Annette, that was a really important point because nobody could speak up about it. So I think it's it's helping people ha uh, have the language to actually name things so they, they can talk about it and also understand, you know, and feel confident. And I think um, people are so afraid of seeming racist that they don't want to say anything. And so it's so hard to have these courageous conversations with people feeling, oh, I might say the wrong thing. Oh, do I call her colored or black or, you know, I mean, those those conversations still exist, you know, those situations still exist where people don't know how what to call me, you know, and um, and feel embarrassed about it, right? So, so sometimes I think we're, we're still in the 1958, 59, <laughs> you know, that 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 we are and we assume because we're in the university we assume that uh, everybody understands I mean I was hosting an event last week and I gave the land acknowledgement and I talked about the elders that come to, to the campus that you know talk to us about what it was like before we built these big structures and and um and they used to skip and play on the lands and so we really are guests on the land and a man in the audience just went he was just so upset about that, you know, and it made me realize, oh, there's lots of work to do. We're not all on the same page because we, I guess the people that we are close to may think the way we do, but there's a wider group of people that we really need to work with and realize that everyone is at a different place. So here's, here's the conundrum for me. We've been having these conversations, mm -hmm. courageous, brave, daring, <laughs> over 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And here we are talking from since George Floyd, talking about anti-black racism, mm -hmm. anti-Asian racism, mm -hmm. anti-indigenous racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and people still don't know how to talk about it in a university environment. <laughs> yeah. No, no. So to that, that to ask me, no, seriously, it asked me how seriously are we investing in education and literacy? How mm -hmm. much are we investing in it? That's a question. I have a real question for all the talk. The yeah. second thing I want to ask is, if you aren't investing in it, so how many leaders do we actually hear? U15, U University of Canada. Actually, I can't recall more than a handful of leaders in my entire career ever saying they were committed to increasing the representation of racialized people in the university or in leadership. I can probably count them in, on one hand. So be let's be truthful about this. People don't talk about it. So you don't know if they don't talk about it, is it the priority? The second thing you, uh, you alluded to, Annette, was that disabilities. <laughs> We have passing reference to disabilities, and then usually we think of one type. So maybe mm -hmm. physical disabilities. We don't think about see. We don't think about seeing, or we don't think, or we think about mobility, but we don't think about deaf culture. We think about other kinds of things. Thirty plus years on with equity, why are we still having these conversations, and why haven't we moved the very far in them? So, what is the blockage? Because are we, are we hiring leaders who don't understand, don't get it, aren't investing in learning and unlearning? Where is, 
what is the what is the blockage? Because some people think we're doing too much on EDI. I would like to see the evidence of that. And some people think uh, we're not doing enough. And I would say on the preponderance of evidence, that's likely true. And I guess one way to start is, I don't want to always put things on, on, the, on, on quantitative data, but what, uh, what, how, how often are universities investing in change? And are they, uh, why should we expect them to invest in change if in fact mm -hmm. the status quo is benefiting those who are in power? So let's have a courageous conversation. Well, I, from an indigenous standpoint, I've thought about this. Why aren't universities uh, reporting at a budget level their investments in Indigenous education. And until the offices of Indigenous initiatives that were at the very senior level were created, it there was activity happening, but there was very little accountability from my perspective. So I've been working in university for 20 years and I've worked in Indigenous student affairs at my university. We were the, the only, the one and only office, right? And I knew that other, there were some moves happening at different, at different times where people were claiming to be doing reconciliation work and getting some sort of envelope funding somewhere, but there was no reporting happening on it. So, um, and I, I I often question that, like who was hired in those roles? What, you know, were, were they collapsing mandates under one role and was an indigenous person being, being considered? And, you know, we have to build capacity, like capacity building for the next, the pipeline. Um, the next generation is really important. And as someone who is based in educational leadership, that's that's my jam. You know, we're, we're, we're built, trying to build capacity, not just in, for the university, but for our communities outside of the academe. So I'm always thinking about like what our hiring processes are and accountability for when offices are getting money in the name of reconciliation and like, where's the reporting? And finally, now offices of Indigenous initiatives, we can see that their budget, you know, I can, we should be pulling up our university budgets and taking a look to see what is the budget of that office and a same for equity. Um, but until those senior offices are created, they get buried. We never really know how much money is going into these initiatives. And I don't think it's enough, really, when, when I think about the land question and how uh, universities obtain the land and use the land to get as assets to, you know, get acquire other land and build capital over generations, like on the backs of Indigenous people, uh, we really need to take a serious uh, consideration here of how much, like it should be like a, a, a no brainer, a certain percentage should go towards Indigenous education and investing in Indigenous communities. That's my <laughs> courageous point on that. I have lots to say on that. So I'll let Julie and, and uh, Annette mm -hmm. have a final word to go ahead, Annette. Oh, um, actually, um, uh, do you want to repeat the question? I sort of lost it because I was listening to Candace. Well, that's, that's okay, we'll come back to another question for you. I'm going to let Julie go to this one. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, we have to get beyond the performative. We have to get beyond the box checking. We have to turn the mirror internally at universities. Yes, there's amazing research. Yes, there's great initiative. I was delighted to hear the hiring that UBC is doing. But as, you know, as as I think it was, as Annette said, you know, what is actually the experience for these people that you're bringing into these organizations? What is actually, you know, we're, we're still working in this white default world and you know how are we talking about breaking that down and and what what change what concrete change you know where are we actually having the metrics and the accountability to drive change and who's holding universities accountable for their internal processes yeah. okay so we have a couple of minutes i want to if, if so if there was if each of you had were asked what is what at least one thing the universities can do to, be, to begin this process of more meaningful change, what would you recommend? I mean, you've- Yeah, one, one thing is, is very hard, but I, I, I think, um, I, th I think really uh, taking, um, looking at leadership differently. Like, as I said before, I really think that leadership takes place in so many forms. And and it could be that little person in the corner, you know, you, you hardly see her on campus, but she's 
she's connecting with the community and she's or she's changing curriculum in really transformative ways uh, uh she's she's basically you know um bringing all new kinds of texts that that all the all the students can see themselves and realize that all authors are not white and male you know so there's leadership in so many ways i know we we're, we're thinking about leadership in terms of uh, taking on uh, an institutional title and role but i think because it takes you know if they say it takes a village but it takes a whole community to transform it yes and but also i would say this is not one but but those people who are leaders make them leaders and not managers make them people who are transformative with a transformative vision who wants to go next I can go. I can say, I think that if the, um, at the very top, if there's an under, a true understanding of allyship, of anti-racism, of what this, you know, white default means and how we can actually break this down and what it really means, if there's an understanding of that at the very top, it, it, it will help. It will not ensure it, but it will help in terms of selection processes, in terms of how decisions are made, um, in terms of, of, the way that that everything is done so there needs to be an understanding at the top um and right now the top is is very white and very male and so we're in a very sad situation in canada right now um and we need to have some significant change to actually see that happen i'll i'll add something really quick it, like this is a complicated problem right so there's not one solution it's it's multifaceted it's long term um, but I will say one thing that I've noticed that's a, like the, the administration at the senior level, they, they rotate, right? Like they don't rotate, but they come in and they, they go. And so I've been around for a few years where we've done such good work and then they leave and then the new ones come in and we start all over again. And I don't, I don't know how we can be more proactive about that. Or is, is it just the hiring? I, I don't know how to solve that, that issue, but like, it's uh, very discouraging because they don't understand the institutional memory that you know some of us do do carry and 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 then it's just it just feels very defeating so it's an issue well i'm sure we can go on but sadly uh, for me and i hope for the i'm sure the audience too our conversation is coming to a close and i want to thank each of you for taking the time out of your Day and all the things you possibly could be doing uh, to join us on this conversation. I hope it has sparked uh, some ideas for change, uh, long overdue, necessary, I would say urgent. Um, and we don't need an event like George Floyd, or we don't need, we shouldn't need this event for us to do a, a, a kind of a self-assessment, raise awareness about courageous leadership um, and about not just the performativity uh, around these things. Um, leadership, I always say that inclusion is actually, it's an, it requires action, not just rhetoric. And people, I, I see people who are, who love saying inclusion and inclusive and inclusivity, and yet their practice maintains the status quo, puts up borders and boundaries, are not consultative and, and, and radically uninclusive. So we need to also call out these kinds of things or speak truth to power. So, but these discussions are important, they're difficult, Let's have no doubt about it, they are risky because they can lead to further marginalization of people who actually are already vulnerable, but they also have the potential to transform if we build up alliances. So I like this idea of thinking about leadership that's not just top down or horizontal, but also bottom up and, and, and transformative. And we need, to, we need to support and nurture and mentor and cultivate those change makers who are going to, 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 who are looking for a world and university otherwise. So thank you for that. And hopefully this conversation will be part of this. Thank you to the, to the guests for your wisdom. Thank you for your openness and participation for your questions. We didn't get to many of them, but I, I greatly appreciate them. Um, um, I, I wanna say to you that all the Courageous Conversations, 10th 2020 are on our website. You can go to ucalgary.ca forward slash equity dash diversity dash inclusion and you will find a uh, array of uh, of uh, webinars and this one too will be released probably within a week 
uh, and we will share it to all of those who, who registered and who were able to attend and who just registered for the video. So thank you all. And I wish you all a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining Courageous Conversations.